Genesis Foundation. Dub Lab. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis LA and Dub Lab. Hosted by Paul Holdengraber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello, Daniela. Hello, Daniela Lamas. This is Dr. Daniela Lamas I'm speaking with, who is a critical yeah. care doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. It's a pleasure to have you on the quarantine tape. Thank you so much for taking uh, my call. It's so important for me uh, to speak with doctors um, who are on the forefront of this virus. I've been speaking with philosophers, I've been speaking with filmmakers, I've been speaking with people who run homeless shelters, but to have your view is tremendously important, so I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to, to be speaking with you. Can you tell me, what, what do your days consist of now, um, with this virus at the hospital where you are practicing doctor? Yeah, so my days are either um, sort of alternate between a feeling of um, uh, sort of holding my breath and waiting, um, being at home and not on call, um, alternating with uh, being in the hospital. And so I'm in Boston, and right now, in the start of April, uh, Boston has not yet had its surge. And I say not yet because I'm told that it will, but I guess I should just say not because we can't actually predict. But um, we've started to become busier, but uh, the hospital, our hospital particularly, has not yet exploded and um, or has not exploded. And so what that means is that they have, our uh, division of pulmonary and critical care medicine has created all sorts of schedules, um, different uh, uh, teams, so it's different colors, there's an orange team and a purple team and a whole rainbow of teams that are going to be quote unquote activated at different times, depending on how many patients you get. And um, we haven't uh, yet had, you know, sort of about half the teams have been activated. And so I'm going to start working in the coronavirus-specific ICU next week, but um, it feels funny because, and by funny I mean uncomfortable because, um, you know, today I spent actually uh, sitting at home, haven't gone outside, um, have been working on papers and such things at home, um, while I also, you know, see my colleagues in New York City suffering and, um, you know, wish that I could be there part of me wishes it but then i'm conflicted and part of me is happy to be safe um but uh given that there's an anticipation that in boston things will get worse um we're asked not to leave the city so i am here waiting uh, and seeing what happens but dr lama i i I would also say that in in many ways the the extraordinary virus we're living through now your work has been in a sense, a preparation for this. Yeah. Uh, in in a, in a, I, you you see what I what I'm saying, and 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 based on on my half question, um, how might you respond? Yes, no, very much so. I feel that that we are um, preparing, and I am preparing. I mean, I've been in the ICU. Um, I was in the ICU for much of March, um, and in the general medical ICU before uh, our hospital built the separating things into a corona-specific ICU. And so I had patients with coronavirus. Um, one uh, who sort of stands out in my mind particularly, uh, but took care of others who we thought might have had it, ended up being negative, some had it. Um, and becoming familiar with sort of the path of physiology, becoming familiar with um, all of the changes to our ICU that are sort of unique to um, this time. Um, particularly the fact that 
while I was there. Uh, we made the shift from the usual ICU standard of practice where families are all about their rounds with us, just for their loved one, obviously not for everyone. Um, and they're like a really integral uh, part of the team, really. Um, their contributions are our key. I was there when we uh, made the decision, when the hospital made the decision, we had to tell people uh, that they couldn't come back again because there are no more families. And now there are no more families in the ICU. So, so sort of I've seen this shift uh, to this kind of new uh, world. And um, now we're waiting to see what happens. Um, but yes, we feel uh, more prepared and I feel more prepared having been in the unit, having taken care of coronavirus patients. You can't prepare for numbers that you're unequipped to deal with, but you can prepare um, You can prepare to be the best equipped you can be, and I think we are. But in, in, in a way, also what I was trying to allude to is that your work, you've worked so much on the, the, the traumatic effects of having spent time in an ICU uh, department, as it were, and then going home for patients going home and finding themselves lost, finding themselves isolated, finding themselves alone. And you've, you've tried in, in many ways to bring about a better understanding for doctors of how they might, might work to, to, to remedy this kind of trauma that patients feel. And I remember so many years ago having the great opportunity of, of uh, interviewing Atul Gawande based on, on, an, mm. on an article I had read of his which just devastated me and I wrote him a fan letter uh, of the kind that is that I'm some sometimes I find an urge to do that you remember that piece in the New Yorker called uh, Letting Go it was such an ex uh, such an extraordinary piece and and in many ways your your two recent extraordinary articles in the the New York Times spoke to me in ways that are not dissimilar which is so many patients now uh, because of social distancing because you can't see them you can't you can't really talk to them in the moments when they are suffering the most and when they might need a lending hand. Actually, you talk about the fact that you're not really able to touch them, partly because you're scared. Yes. Yes. I mean, all of that is, is so true. Um, and thank you for that kind words and kind comparison. Um, and yeah, you know, there is there is definitely uh, has been so much uh, loss and shift of trying to figure out and preparing to figure out how to be a doctor in this kind of new framework where those moments that define your interactions with these other people, you know, a hand on a shoulder, um, a smile that was visible because you could see somebody's mouth that wasn't uh, hidden behind a mask. Um, those are gone uh, because of the really clear and pressing and not controvertible, you know, external realities um, of this virus. Uh, but, you know, it feels, it feels very odd. And um, we are both preparing and I'm preparing myself to kind of understand this while also knowing that there's no real preparation that can be done because it's, um, very dark and you know we try to bring an ipad and sort of thing not something but when it comes down to it people are sick and they are scared and they are alone and families are separated and quarantined and alone and that's that's the truth and technology is great but still the truth dr lamas um your your recent piece which i was i was mentioning a moment ago is so extraordinary that if you don't mind I want to read a paragraph from it. It it came out um, about Thank you. Uh, about a week ago. It's called "I'm on the front lines. I have no plan for this." And um, you talk about a patient who is with um, their their uh, wife, I believe, um, and uh, they. This is the last time they will be able to see each other because of the necessity. Mm -hmm. of, of social distancing and I I will read this and I have to say it's 
it's it's pretty pretty tough to read i read it to my own children it's it's really <sighs> quite quite extraordinary i i think it's tremendously important for everyone to hear this at this moment but now as we tighten our protocols to protect our patients from the threat of covid-19 she's alone here in my hospital as in so many others throughout the country with banished most visitors it's a tough decision that leaves our patients to suffer through their illnesses in a medical version of social of solitary confinement and i'm worried for them because those of us on the front lines simply don't have plans for this the isolation is of course even more profound for those who are infected with or are being evaluated for coronavirus i look i took care of one such patient who was intubated when he started co coughing up blood on the general medical floor he was alone in his room on facetime with his daughter when it started so that is the last image she has of her father on a shaky computer screen blood staining his hospital gown i offer her updates over the phone but the truth is that i'm not sure when she will ab be able to see him again extraordinary extraordinary what you're living through and the predicament you find um, yourself in front yeah and it's extraordinary what these what these people are in right like people who just you know have the misfortune to be sick either with coronavirus or with something entirely other as it turns out this gentleman that i wrote about turns out he doesn't have coronavirus he ended up being negative really? uh, but his daughter still couldn't see him because of the hospital rules yeah um so it's for for everybody people have are are going through you know their own catastrophes and tragedies that maybe are about coronavirus maybe aren't and they're living these tragedies out alone and and they're living through this um the gentleman actually uh ended up doing well um he was uh, extubated the breathing tube came out uh, early this past week he still hasn't seen his family because he's still in the hospital and he still can't get visitors but um before the breathing tube came out the night before he was we were starting to wake him up from the sedation he was waking up you know he was he was with it he knew that he was in a hospital and there was a breathing tube down his throat and he was displeased um and so we called up his daughter and his son and put them on speakerphone and stuck the phone next to his ear slightly deaf and they screamed i love you dad i love you dad and um he clearly heard them and that would have been great, you know, as an ending image. Uh, but he gets an even better ending image, which is that the next day the two came out, he's left the ICU and goes to the general medical floor. And so I don't know. I wrote that it was a, not when, but if she saw her father again, and I feel like it's now a when she will see her father again. That was a pretty dire, uh, news these days and so that was a bit of positivity yes. that, that i enjoyed at least and in a way what you've done so beautifully now is update your own article which had yes. such which had such a, a a a resonant quality to it um it made you you it, it really put us like atul does so well in in that moment in that moment where in that same article you talk about the fact that you'd love to touch uh, that that you're the kind of doctor who would love to touch the hand of your patients to comfort them but you can't and you say i can't i'm scared true yeah, it's true i am um i just uh, coughed while we were talking and i've had a cough for a day or two and um i haven't you know i'm not going into hospital till next week and i'm feeling okay and you know there hasn't been there hasn't been a reason uh yet uh, to get tested for coronavirus and it's just a cough right but but you have these moments of panic you have the moments of panic at home um is this a cough just a cough am i suddenly short of breath i go on the treadmill to make sure i can still run you know a quick couple of miles yes i can not short of breath will be okay uh, and you, you feel that in the room. Um, if I breathe this air, am I, am I potentially, uh, doing myself harm? 
Uh, can I go faster? Is there a reason to do this part of the physical exam? Am I just falling through this protocol because it's a protocol I've learned, but is it necessary here? And with that, and it, it's a dual, it's for dual purposes. You know, it's, it's fear for oneself. There's also the real and sort of practical um, need to conserve uh, personal and protective inqu- equipment, PPE. You know, if you can avoid going into the room, well, gosh, then you've avoided using or using, reusing masks currently. And, and eye protection, but you've avoided using a fresh gown and at least two sets of gloves. So, so there's many incentives to limit the number of times you go into a room. And then once you're in there, there's the really the only thing keeping you from staying for a while is the fact that you're, you're scared. And, and also, patients who are sick enough to be in the ICU with coronavirus are often intubated. Their lungs are quite fragile to the extent that they need uh, at least two sedative drips to keep them sort of from doing more harm to themselves on the ventilator. And so they're deeply asleep, but it's a different way of being a doctor for sure. It's, it's one where, where fear is pervasive and fear wasn't there at all. Not fear for my own face, you know, fear that I was making a mistake or that I wasn't doing the right thing for my patients. For sure. I feel that often, but the idea that you'd also be scared for yourself is, is entirely foreign to me. In another piece uh, in the New York Times that I think came out yesterday, which is called What If We Have to Decide Who Gets a Ventilator, the kind of description you have in that piece reminds us of Sophie's Choice. Who, who, <laughs> who can, who, you know, patients who are speaking to you and, and, and in some way trying to impress you that they are worthy of getting a ventilator. Can you, can you describe the kind of really ethical situation a lot of doctors find themselves in now at this present moment? And, you know, in the end, who will be apt in some way to make that decision, which seems to be such a terrifying one to make under any circumstance? Yeah, so, you know, as as a critical care doctor who's going to be taking care and have, have been taking care of these patients, it seems quite clear that it would not be me who makes these decisions. And that's, I think that's, I was going to say it's for better or worse. I think it's mostly, I think it's for better. Right. You don't want somebody to um, make that decision at 3 a.m. Right holding a person's fate in their hands in a way that, which we do, right, but in a way that feels capricious, you know, it's just, it's uh, 3 a.m. decision business doesn't make sense. Um, no decisions are good at 3 a.m. And a decision about a person getting a life safety intervention is the very worst. But so, so the way that, you know, my understanding, and this is a work in progress um, throughout the country, but uh, broadly um, the way that these practices and sort of protocols work, my understanding is that um, there is a, and I don't know how it will end up unfolding in my hospital or in Boston or, Boston or in Massachusetts specifically, but when people write about these sorts of ethical decisions, what they recommend is that there's kind of a set of criteria uh, by which patients are ranked, really, in a way that's not dissimilar from a transplant list. You know, people are ranked both by the need that they have for the intervention or the organ, and then also the likelihood that they'll benefit from it, that they will live to hospital discharge and beyond. And so I think that in many rankings is a key criteria. You know, we're not just going to use a ventilator to support somebody for 24 hours. Is this somebody who is sick enough to need it and well enough otherwise so that there's a chance that they can get out of the hospital? And so there will be some, you know, my understanding, these protocols that exist and that have existed even before um, coronavirus, you know, put that into the equation. How this is actually, and and many um, writers on this also um, say that there should be a, quote unquote, sort of triage officer, like somebody who's not the bedside doctor who's implementing these things. Um how that actually feels. I mean, that's what I was trying to understand as I was writing, because right. even if you're not the person making the decision, this person is your patient. That's right. Um, and I still think it, it must 
feel a way that I never want to feel. You know, as a doctor, you are used to making the best decision for your patient. We don't generally make decisions with the good of the broader public in mind. I don't say, I'm not going to give you this antibiotic because we might be running short. No, I say I'm going to give you this antibiotic because it's the right antibiotic for you. Um, and so the idea that we would be carrying forward decisions that are really for the good of the public and not necessarily the individual is uh, a challenge and, you know, something that I, um, I hope does not come to pass. And I, I am so sad for my colleagues in places where it will come to pass. But it sounds like it will. It sounds like, it sounds like this moment will uh, put doctors in in a position which is, as you said, tremendously uncomfortable because you usually work for the benefit of a particular individual patient, not making a choice between a very able 50-year-old and perhaps a less able 80-year-old. And in that way, I was saying earlier, the work you have done before the virus, uh, in a way, might inform the way you will practice um, now that the virus is is amongst us. And just a few days ago, I spoke, Daniela, with a, a philosopher um, who teaches at the mm. new, new School in uh, New York, who spent a lot of time uh, thinking about death and dying. After all, Socrates said that to philosophize is to learn how to die. And he... He said that this moment is a very philosophical moment, um, mm. and I'm I'm wondering um, how that resonates for you. I, I have a feeling it might. It's a different way of putting it is that it is a moment where certain priorities are coming into the foreground. Perhaps a certain way of looking at our medical establishment is coming to the foreground. It's posing deep ethical questions. And I'm wondering um, how you might respond to these queries. <laughs> I think we're we're all under a threat, and for me personally, there's there is this kind of real, um, and I I vacillate between actually kind of recognizing this and ignoring this, but this mm. real loss of you know some pseudo uh, invincibility that I had of. Yeah, you know, I go through my day and not really any risk of anything, and I can kind of do what I want. You know, I can see my family what I what I want. They live in Miami. I can fly there. I can. Um, uh, I spent the fall and summer flying back and forth from Boston to LA for something, and like you know, you have the the idea that you can sort of just craft things as you want, and um, this stopped that. I mean, everyone has stopped, and. I think that in that way, um, when you're focusing on a single goal, which is this, this invisible sort of threat that we are all facing, um, there's, there's something, it feels like there should be something crystallizing about it. I'm not sure what exactly has crystallized for me. Um, so I think if it's a philosophical moment, I can feel what that means, but but I'm not sure what conclusion comes from that, at least for me. You, 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 you wrote that you worry that unless we find some way to mitigate the overwhelming isolation this virus has created, we will leave a fleet of wounded patients and family survivors in its wake. Speak to me about yeah. that, because that, 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 that sentence of yours... Also, I must say, Daniela haunted me. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I've been very interested before coronavirus in uh, uh, what happens to people who survive uh, critical illness and not just somebody who's, you know, in the, and not, I'm not saying just like in a small, but not somebody who is in the ICU for a day recovering from a procedure. Um, somebody who uh, has been sick enough to need a ventilator uh, for at least sort of a couple of days. And these are patients I've taken care of for years now and for a long time had um, simply felt victorious when they left the ICU. We were say let us looking and seeming nothing like how they came in. I thought, you know, we did a great job. They were a success, which is defined by being alive. 
in my head at that time. And then became interested in, you know, what were people's long-term outcomes? And we know that people who survive critical illness have something that we call post-intensive care syndrome. So anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, some cognitive dysfunction, and a decent percentage, not all, not nearly all, less than half, but it exists. And so, you know, I wonder about in the setting of coronavirus, uh, with families separated from patients, with uh, patients, doctors wearing you know, quite clear, visible barriers um, between them, whether these outcomes goes for the patients and then the somewhat similar outcomes that are described for families are going to be worse, particularly for patients who don't do well. Right. And the families, because they can't be, haven't been there. I mean, it, it, the, 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 the has to leave some mark. And so I wonder about that, about what will be the kind of ripples and repercussions, um, even when the active threat is no longer as present as it is now. Do you feel that um, this this calamity of this virus might? I mean, it, are you are you hopeful, or do you do you believe that we have reason to be hopeful that the way um, the way the 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 public might be insured, and the way in which maybe medicine will be practiced? after this virus passes in the U.S. might change and maybe might change yeah. for the better? Or, or differently put, what are your hopes? Yeah, I'm hopeful that we don't, when, when this fades, uh, I think everything ends at some point, when this fades, um, I hope that we don't uh, just go back to normal. I mean, in some ways, I hope that we go back to normal. Life. Do you enjoy restaurants? Right. Sorry, going out to drinks, but but I hope that from the, the you know one thing that has come of this is that there has been tremendous innovation really quickly. I mean, people who had no uh, remote practices have been seeing patients, um, you know, in telemedicine. So they've set up entire telemedicine practices, which right. are things that would take people like a year to do, or they would maybe not even do it. And um, I hope that we stop bringing people into the office if they don't need to be brought in. You know, I hope that medicine does acknowledge that there is danger in the hospital. Maybe it's not coronavirus, but the hospital is not necessarily the best place for anyone to be. Um, and, uh, and it's definitely not convenient for a lot of people. And so, and so I hope that some of these innovations that are born of this sort of, you know, uh, tragic necessity that they remain, um, I hope that we learn a lesson about preparedness. That's kind of, you know, I can hope for it, but uh, I also could see a world where it doesn't happen. But I, I do hope that we learn a lesson about the fact that that we need to be ready for things that seem entirely implausible. I mean, I remember in sometime in February, a friend of mine was tracking uh, coronavirus in Wuhan and telling me the numbers every day. And, He was worried, and I just couldn't imagine a world in which this actually threatened us. Um, I was wrong, obviously. But I think being ready for these possibilities, um, re and by ready I mean crazy to me that we don't have the PPE that we need. It's crazy to me that we don't have a sufficient number of ventilators. So ready in those ways, I hope that that will, that will also change. Um, and... I don't know. From the family in the hospital perspective, I think that we understand its value, and I think that when this threat is over, they will come back in, and I hope that we will have found by then ways, really reliable, good ways, to keep people involved when they can't be here. I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been to speak to you, and um, I hope that when all of this passes, you and I will meet in person. But thank That would be lovely. Thank you so much, and uh, all the best, and I hope uh, the weeks ahead at your hospital will go as smoothly as we can possibly imagine or hope for. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Hope you uh, stay well, too. Thank all you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, 
go to dublab.com support. Thank you.